I want to thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, first session of our class, Stained Glass People, which is going to examine the lives of the saints over the course of the fall. So I'm really excited about this class for a number of reasons. One of them is that it has been a little while since I've taught a class. It's been since before Easter, I guess. I needed a little bit of a break and was trying to work on um, some other priorities of the parish and the material for, for this class for the fall. And so it's really good, actually, to be here this morning. I was like, this may be a bad thing to admit, but during the 8 o'clock service, I was like, I, I was like really eager to get done so I could come in here and do this, okay? So I hope it's good because I'm really excited. So if I, I'm really excited about mediocrity, that's not good, okay? But I hope it's good. I hope it's good. Um, so, so why this class? Why a class on the saints? Well, I think examining the lives of the saints actually is really important for us as Christians. Um, one, because all of us wonder and ask ourselves, what does it look like? What does it mean to live a holy life? What does it look like to follow Jesus? I mean, today, those of you who are at the 8 o'clock, or maybe you've already looked at the readings for this morning, but uh, those of you who are at the 8 know that our gospel reading for today uh, is a pretty heavy hitter. Uh, and Jesus has some very strong words for his followers about what it looks like and what it costs to be a disciple and to follow Jesus. And so, um, and so I think we all wonder, what does it look like to lead a holy life? And the saints help us answer that question. Um, another reason I think it's important to talk about the saints um, is because uh, they also teach us and tell us not just something about holy living, what we're to do, but I think they reflect for us at least somewhat something of the nature of God. There's simply something um, deeply incarnational, uh, well, obviously, because the saints are people, um, they are incarnate uh, but, uh, beings. But as divine image bearers, as all of us you know, bear the image of God in some way, studying the lives of the saints also helps us see, I think, something of God's nature and God's gift of grace to us. And so, um, so that's what this class is about. I've subtitled it Ordinary People, Extraordinary Faith, although some of the saints were extraordinary people, so had extraordinary faith. Um, but we'll, we'll look at those. So over the course of this study, what we'll be doing is each week we're going to take uh, one or a few, uh, depending on the week, um, different saints, talk about their lives and what they have to teach us, what their witness might have to teach us about those questions that I just mentioned. Uh, but today, I want us to start with this question. I think it's actually sort of elemental. Who is a saint? I had what is a saint to begin with, but then I thought about, I don't know, who felt more personal, but you get what I'm saying. What makes a saint a saint? When we talk about, are we talking about? I think this is an important question for us to discuss. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today is uh, what is a saint? How do we know one when we see one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so let's dive in. But actually, before we dive in, I didn't pray. That's like the important, I got to start with prayer. Um, so the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I thank you so much to be gathered together this morning with your saints, to study your saints, to talk about what it means to live and lead a holy life. I pray that both today and throughout this study, we would be strengthened by the examples of the faithful who have come before, that we would continue to live in your way, to walk in your way, and to love you more deeply each and every day of our lives. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen. See, I told you I was so excited. I even almost forgot to pray. Okay? Hey. So, all right, so let's dive into this question. Um, oh, here we go. I, this was better. Who is or what makes a saint? Now, there are a lot of ways of answering this question. This slide is going to go through some of those. Um, but this was actually one of the first questions that I had personally when I joined the Episcopal Church. Because growing up, I didn't grow up in a tradition that really had much of an idea of the saints as a class of people that one kind of venerated in their life of faith. I'm um, done. That was something that Catholics did, right? We didn't do that really as Protestants. And so when I became Episcopalian, and there were like, a cal there was a calendar with saints' days in it, I was sort of like, wait, what does this mean? How, does, how do we understand this? How does this work? And it was one of the first questions that I actually asked the rector of my church as a little baby Episcopalian. Um, I was at lunch with him one day, 
he'd given me a prayer book and I'd been, you know, I'd been just rifling through it and just, uh, just absorbing everything um, that was in there. And, and I came away with a few questions and one of them was, how does the Episcopal Church, and I mentioned this little story because actually it's what he told me next that informed the title of this class and which is I think an actually a pretty helpful way of thinking about a saint which is as a stained glass person. Now, he began by saying a saint is an invisible person. And what he meant by that is a saint is somebody that you see right through. Their life is such that you see through them straight to God. That there's something about the way that a, a saint has lived, something about their witness, that shows us, again, something of the nature of God in a special way. But then he talked about stained glass people, that there were people that we commemorated in the stained glass of our churches, right? And we tend to think of those as saints, like there's a glass window of St. Richard right over there in the entryway to the church. But that, but that that metaphor works on multiple levels. It's not just the people who we venerate that way, but it's also the people who we see through to God. Uh, we can see through their lives and see the glory of God shining behind it. And I just love that image. I think it's very poetic. It works on multiple levels. The English major in me was sold. Okay, I said, that works. I can deal with that. Um, now, saints have actually been around since the very earliest days of the church. And by saints, I mean people kind of gathering around to remember a particular and important person in the life of their community. Uh, the earliest uh, Christian communities in the first couple centuries would do this. There started to be little local observances around particularly holy people that lived in different places. It wasn't until later on that the capital C church started to actually think about who we as a group of Christians should um, remember and commemorate uh, with different feast days. So used to it used to be like you know, you had some particularly holy person like Kathy, um, and, uh, and Kathy would go on to greater glory, and we here in Round Rock would remember Kathy on that day by celebrating the Eucharist, by gathering for church, right, and by saying prayers of thanksgiving for Kathy's life and witness of what it meant to us. And so you started to have these little pockets of, of saints pop up around, and then eventually the church says, well, we need to standardize this somehow, and that's kind of how you get our idea of saints. We'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more in a second. But they've been around for a long time, the idea that there are particularly holy people in our midst. Um, but that's not the only way to understand a saint. Actually, in the letters of Paul, Pretty much any baptized Christian is referred to as a saint. We even see this in today's readings. We've got a, a reading from Philemon uh, for the epistle, and Paul refers to the saints, lower S, which is, is us. It's all of us. We are saints, right? We are the saints of God and another. And there's a couple more. I'm just going to go ahead and put them up here. Boop. Okay. Um, is because I do think we need to think, think about saints in two senses. There's a sense in which there are people, and we've probably all known one even, someone who lived just such an exemplary Christian life that their witness, right, we've probably known someone like that. Um, and yet, there's also a sense in which, by virtue of our baptism, we are all the saints in light. And I think holding those two ideas of what a saint is in tension is really, really important. Because I think they're both true, right? They're both true. And so I, I, I don't want us to get hung up on this idea, and it wouldn't be very Episcopalian, even, you know, for us to get hung up on this idea that you have to be a capital ST saint, right, to be in this category. Um, but I do think that there are people who have led exempt. So, um, so I think it's, it's a both and situation here. Okay. So I'm not going to then does one determine a saint. Actually, I had this really good definition of a saint given to me one time um, by Bishop Neil Alexander, who is the former dean of the seminary where I went. Uh, and he also is a liturgic scholar um, by trade, um, a very, very good one, very well-known one. And um, he talked about how the development of the Feast of All Saints, but there's also All Souls. It's All Saints and All Souls. And the idea of All Saints Day was to celebrate Saint Mary. The idea of All Souls Day is to celebrate your Aunt Mary. And that was kind of how he distinguished the two, right? That both are worthy of our remembrance, but one is sort of held up for the entire church and one is sort of, anyway, I think that's a good, a good to keep those two things in tension. So I always think of All Saints and All Souls. Anyway, all right. 
So I'm not going to bore you with how a saint becomes a saint in the Episcopal Church, because we do have a calendar of saints, and honestly, it's very messy, and if you ask an Episcopalian at General Convention, a lot of people argue, and maybe sometimes someone gets included. There's a lot of dispute about it. It's very messy. Very messy. Because we hold these things in tension, it's incredibly hard to figure out, well, who gets included in the book, right? Who gets a feast day if, if you're commemorating both saint saints and smaller s saints? Anyway, it's a whole thing. So I'm not going to go into it. But there is... Oh, wait. Oh, I forgot about this great quote. This is very long, so I'm going to break it up for you. Sorry, this is another way of understanding saints. Before we talk about uh, the Roman Catholic Church and how they think about qualifications for sainthood, just to give you an idea about how some of these conversations go in the life of, of the church. But I really like this um, um, lectures uh, 14 and 15 on the value of saintliness in the, his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, okay, from 1902. And I'll break it up for you. William James defines a saint this way. I actually really love, love this definition. He says, the saints are authors, actores, which is literally just the Latin word for authors, so it just makes you look fancier but he just, used, he just used the same word twice, okay? Uh, the saints are authors. They are increasers of goodness. He says, St. Paul long ago made our ancestors at the idea that every soul is virtually sacred, right? That's what I just said, that in Paul's writings, we're all a saint in some, in some form or fashion, right? The saints in light. Since Christ died for all without exception, St. Paul said, we must despair of no one. The saints, with their extravagance of human tenderness, are the great torchbearers of this belief, the tip of the wedge, the cleavers of the darkness. So I love this, right, because what James is doing here is saying that there are these, like, capital S saints, but they actually are sort of at the... Da, da, da. Okay, so the world is not yet with them. They often seem in the midst of the world's affairs to be preposterous, yet they are impregnators of the world, vivifiers and animators of the potentialities of goodness which but for them would lie forever dormant. They, in essence, they show us, each of us, a better and more fulsome way of living. Um, and uh, they're like these kind of innovators, right, that show us a better way before we can conceive of it ourselves. And he goes on to say, it is not possible to be quite as mean as we naturally are when they have passed before us. Right? There's a way of being in their presence that enriches us, enlivens our faith, makes us better people. One fire kindles another, he says, and without that overtrust in human worth which they show, the rest of us would lie in spiritual stagnancy. I really love this quote. I really, really love it because I think it does all of the things I was just describing about looking at this both and, right? Looking at the idea of a saint as both a capital S saint and also a lowercase s saint that we all are, right? Um, because again, I think we would all acknowledge that there are people who do live lives of exemplary holiness that do all of these things. So I offer that quote to you. Because I think that's a, and we'll actually come back to it throughout this study, because I think it's a good frame for us to think about the lives of the saints and what they do for us. Okay. So, what is the process in the Catholic Church? Talk about how do you become a saint. I just think it's interesting to look at this. We won't spend a, a whole bunch of time on this, um, but I wanted to go through it with you because it just gives you an idea 
of the challenge that lies before the church when they try to do things like adjudicate holiness, okay? Um, it gets very, very tricky, all right? It just really does. When you're trying to grade someone on a holiness scale, it's thorny business, okay? But this is how the Catholic Church does it in, in, in summation, okay? So it's a five-step process to canonization, to becoming a saint in the roughly five steps. Um, Oh, wow, those two came up, but that's fine. First of all, you have to die. You've got to be dead, okay? That's the first step to becoming a saint in the Catholic Church. You cannot be still living. It, may, it sounds funny, but you do. You've got to die. You have to be dead. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Well, I'm going to talk about each of these steps in depth uh, in my next slides. But then you have to have an investigation of life. They have to sort of look at your life and biography. Then you become uh, the venerable so-and-so. And then you get beatified and you become the blessed so-and-so. And then, if you have sufficient holiness, you are deemed a saint. You reach sainthood and you become saint so-and-so. And you become in the, canonized in the canon of the saints. The big book, the official book of who is a saint. Okay, So those are the five steps, but let's talk about them in uh, a little bit greater depth. Step one. This one seems pretty straightforward because it was just you have to die, okay? You've got to be dead. Um, but there is a typical five-year waiting period after someone dies before you can be considered uh, for this process, okay? Uh, and the reason is, uh, it is to allow for greater objectivity when um, the church is considering canonization. Like, let's say there was a bunch of, uh, this was a really well-beloved person, right? And so, therefore, when they pass away, everybody says, oh, surely, like, we've got to make them a saint. Um, and maybe they were an excellent and very well-beloved person, but might not fit some of these other categories, and so therefore there's this waiting, waiting period. Now, having said that, the Pope can and has waived that requirement in the past. So there is this requirement, but it's, as most, th most things in the Catholic Church, up to the discretion of the, of the Pope. Um, and so, uh, so there's this five-year waiting period. I will say that having a waiting period to be included in any kind of church calendar, Roman Catholic or not, is pretty standard. The Episcopal Church has one as well, actually. There's a, a typical waiting period for how long someone has to have passed away before the church can argue about whether or not they should be included in the calendar for commemorations. And it's basically the same thing. Um, it's to avoid kind of this sort of a fan club getting all of these people in right after their death or whatever, but really thinking about do they have lasting importance in the life of the church in that way. Okay, we won't spend any more time on that, but that's step one. So step two, an investigation of the individual's life begins. And this isn't like, uh, like a criminal investigation. It's like a background check or something. But it's, it's, um, it's, it's basically a, an, a, a study of their biography. Um, there's actually an agency of the Roman Catholic Church, a department uh, called the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, okay? And they're the official body in the church that does this work. Uh, and what they do is they do these investigations, and then, as the slide says, they make recommendations to the Pope to open the case uh, for canonization for this person, to begin this process, in other words. So what are they looking for? What does it mean that they do an investigation? Okay, well, what are they looking for? Well, this gets us to step three. The Congregation for the Causes of the Saints, which I just abbreviate CCS. I don't know if they do that or not, but I didn't want to type that out every time. So, um, so that's, that's that. Uh, investigates the evidence of the candidate's holiness. Now, this evidence includes works that they performed or the existence of faithful Christians who have been drawn to prayer or deepened in their own faith on account of the candidate's example, okay? If this investigation leads the CCS to recommend the candidate to the Pope to continue in this process, they are then deemed venerable, which means that their life was of heroic virtue, okay? Um, and so that's why you will see one of my favorite... Uh, I guess now, I guess he's a saint, but, the, but Bede, the venerable Bede, old church historian who was a monk in the early, early days of England, wrote one of the earliest histories of the English Isles. Um, he was venerable, okay? And so that's what that means, is, is this is what's happened. Okay, so that's step three. Step four, the next step is beatification, or uh, to become called the blessed so-and-so. 
Um, and to do this, you have to have assurance, okay, that the venerable so-and-so is in fact saved and in heaven. You wouldn't want to make someone a saint who maybe isn't up there. Like, that would be bad, right? We don't want to do that, okay? And so, uh, so how do you determine this, right? This is what I'm saying. This gets very dicey. There are a lot of reasons why I'm glad I'm a Protestant. It's looking at this kind of makes, is one of those things, okay? Um, but here's, if the candidate was a martyr, okay, if they died for their faith, this is sufficient evidence because if you're killed on behalf of your faith, you got to be in heaven, right? Like, we just have to assume. If you were willing to die for it, you're up there, okay? Um, if you were not martyred for your faith, then evidence of at least one miracle, either during this person's lifetime or as a result of their intercession, is required. Now, there needs to be a little asterisk here. We're going to pause to talk about how the saints work. Uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, the saints work by being... Um, again, up in heaven already. They're enjoying heavenly glory presently. And because of that, they are like uh, a good friend uh, or someone, again, who has led an extremely exemplary life that you can ask for prayer to. You can ask them to pray for you, right? So if you've, and, and a saint becomes associated with a particular kind of thing. So like if you've lost a thing, you might pray to one saint to find it, say, hey, you know, saying, so-and-so, I really need to find this object. Could you pray for me to find it? Could you, could you talk to God about that, basically? Or like, if you need to sell your house, you may pray to St. Joseph and bury a little statue of him in your yard, right? And you may be like, hey, Joseph, could you please talk to God about selling the house? It'd be really good if we could get over asking, okay? And that's kind of the idea, right? Um, a lot of people confuse this with praying to a saint as if you can't ask God yourself. That's not the point. The point is to invoke the saint and ask them to pray on your behalf. Okay? That's how the Roman Catholic Church kind of understands this. And so, um, so, so when I say as a result of their intercession, that's what I mean. Is let's say you've got cancer and you're in the hospital and you pray and you say, uh, you know, St. Teresa or something, you know, would you pray for me, intercede on my behalf, and you, you're cured miraculously, that could be considered a miracle that Teresa has performed, even though Teresa is not with us. Does that make sense? You just kind of track in with this? Okay. Now again, not to denigrate anyone for whom this is a significant part of their spiritual life and piety, but they, these are moments where I feel a little more Protestant, okay? A little more Protestant than Catholic. Um, but, you know, there are people who have very, um, where, where the example in life of the saints is actually a very deep uh, part of their piety and spiritual life. And so I really don't mean to make light of that, but that's not necessarily the way that we theologically understand that in the Episcopal Church. But that's what I mean when I say this line, uh, that they performed a miracle either during their lifetime or as a result of their intercession for somebody. So, so anyway, so you've got to attest to this. There's an investigation. They have to attest that this, yes, do. Yes, this is very, yes, Duke, very good, yes. So liturgically, and yeah, in our right one service, there is um, a, a little section called the Comfortable Words that we don't really uh, include in uh, the right two, I think, very sadly. We should maybe be able to include them in there. Um, but one of the thing, things that's in there, there are verses from Scripture, and one of them is if, that if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Um, and and that's, that was intentional to be said in the English Reformation in response to this, that our advocate is the great high priest, Jesus Christ, who is eternally interceding on our behalf, so we do not need to invoke the saints, right? We don't need to invoke the saints. And in fact, actually, the fact that we commemorate some of the Reformation folks in our church calendar would probably give them hives. Uh, the fact that we have days where we remember their martyrdom and whatever, they'd probably be like, excuse me. Um, you know, that's, we, we were burned at the stake for trying not to do that. Um, anyway, but I'm sorry the church is messy that way again. We, uh, but, uh, but anyway, so yes, so that, that is why that's in there. That's a good, a good uh, thing to point out. Okay, so step five, this is the final step to become, these are a little bit different. Again, if you are martyred for your faith, that changes it a little bit. But if you were just like a good person who died of natural cause, you got to do something miraculous. 
Okay, that's, that's part of the criteria. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, some of this seems kind of arbitrary, like why two miracles? One miracle seems actually kind of, because as we'll also discover about the lives of the saints as we continue, part of what makes a lot of them saints is not that they were really good, super broken people who found God's grace break into their life in like this tremendous way. I mean, one of the most examples of this that gets turned into a joke a lot is famous. Bishop of the church, without whom our theology, some would argue, may be better. I like Augustine, but that's a seminary joke. That was intended only for Tanner over here. Um, but, uh, but he, right, had this famous prayer, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet, uh, St. Augustine's famous prayer. Um, that's what I'm saying, right? The saints are not perfect people, far from it. In fact, the saints are often incredibly flawed. We don't even have to go outside of Scripture to know that. Paul is an excellent example of this, who we sometimes refer to as St. Paul, but as a good Baptist, I was always the Apostle Paul. You wouldn't say St. Paul is always the Apostle Paul. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, Paul is a famous persecutor of the church, right? And in fact, actually, the book of Acts very dramatically tells us um, that when Stephen, who uh, we may actually talk about next week, we're going to talk about biblical saints in the early church next week, uh, but St. Stephen is being stoned to death for his profession of the faith. And in order to be able to throw the rocks harder, people throw their cloaks at Paul's feet, right? I mean, this was Paul, far from perfect. And yet today, as most Sundays, we read one of his letters as scripture, right? Okay, so like the, the life of the saints, they're not perfect people. They're not perfect people. Um, but by their life and example, we see something profound of God's action um, in their lives and therefore God's act of grace towards us. And so I... I want to I wanna make that um, really clear. So it's hard, I guess. It's hard when the church tries to come up with, well, what does a holy life really look like? And so the Roman Catholic Church, this is their stab at it. And honestly, there could be worse stabs at it. You know what I mean? To, to try to figure out how to, how to, you know, figure out whose life is worth remembering in these special ways. I tend to think... Uh, that it's a little less scientific. It's kind of like, well, you know it when you see it. But you can really just, that's a horrible rubric for judging. So there you go. But that's Cameron Nation's way of a saint, is you know one when you see one. Um, OK, so that's, that's how that goes. So question, who is a saint, right? Who is a saint? A saint is someone who's lived an exemplary life, uh, who's emulated for us what it looks like to follow Jesus. That could be somebody that we would pay money to put in stained glass in the... Or that could be any one of us, right, who are sitting in this room today. Who is a saint? It's a both, both and. Now, I want to take the remaining few minutes that we have. Man, I'm doing good. Week one. Y'all who have done this with me before know that I am not good on time management on these things. I get off my notes. I start saying stuff. But we're doing good today so that I can mess it up next week. Um, so I want to I wanna move uh, to the, in the last thing that we talk about. Oh, here's all of our stuff again. Oh, it's a review. So we're sticking with stained glass person. That's, that's, that's going to be our working definition of a saint, pulling from all of that stuff that William James said that we'll revisit later on about a saint as an author of, sort of, uh, and a, a sort of innovator for us of holiness. But I want to um, turn our attentions to something that I find really interesting. Um, this is, uh, actually comes from a good, good friend and mentor of mine, Rob McSwain, who is my academic advisor and seminary at Suwannee. And um, a few years ago, four years ago now, he got a grant, a pretty substantial grant, actually, from the Templeton Trust, uh, Religion Trust, to write a book. And it's a book on sainthood that should be finished soon. He assured me this summer, but all academics, nothing is ever finished, and the deadline just keeps moving and moving and moving and moving. But apparently the test is saying, you've got to finish this up, because um, we who gave it. Um, so he's about to go on sabbatical, and I'm ensured that the book will come out. But, um, but his, his premise is based on, um, basically, it's, well, I've got a whole video that's going to summarize it for you, but it's really an odd. And it comes from um, a quote. Well, wait, before I say this, how many of you, because I know uh, some of you either were in or listened to, after the fact, my class on uh, the sacrament I did earlier this year, walking sacraments. 
Okay, so that, that class on the sacraments, which was all about how each of the sacraments um, invites us into a holy life, the name of that class and the premise behind it um, comes from a theologian named Austin Ferrer, who I mentioned to you. He was a Percy Lewis's, and he um, is a not studied enough, in my opinion, theologian, uh, who is the chaplain to uh, one of the colleges in Oxford. He was actually the person who brought the day before he died, though no one knew C.S. Lewis was about to die, including C.S. Lewis. He dropped dead of a heart attack, so it wasn't, it wasn't like he was on his deathbed or something. But anyway, guy, and uh, his scholarship is so, so fascinating, it holds up. And, and the premise of this on the sacraments comes from one of his sermons where he talked about the priest as a walking sermon. And I actually think that that applies to any baptized Christian, that out in the world, we have an opportunity to be outward and visible signs of God's grace, right? That that's, and actually by in, engaging uh, and experiencing the sacraments, uh, that is what gives us the nourishment and the sustenance to do that important work, to be outward and visible signs of God's grace in the world, okay? Well, the reason I mention all of that to you is because Austin Farrer makes an appearance in this video because he inspired this work from Rob McSwain. Rob McSwain, in, uh, I would love to have him here. Uh, he also was the editor of the Cambridge Companion. To, and so he's just, he's a great teacher. He's an interesting guy. Um, but I'm intrigued by this because the quote from Farrer is this one, that the saint is our evidence. And Farrer's idea, which he just sort of says in passing, but that Rob McSwain really wanted to explore, is that actually the lives of the saints may be for us an argument for the existence of God. And that their example of holy living actually is um, a test to God's real being, right? Um, and so he started to explore this question and he got this grant to write this book and they made this little video. And so I'm going to play this video. It's about four minutes long or so. Um, and to conclude today, because I think it's another interesting way to think about the lives and what they mean. So there will be some time for questions after this, but that's, that's a little bit of background on this video. Um, so here we go. I don't think that we can prove the existence of God, but I do think that there are reasons to believe. So the question is, what are those reasons and are they good ones? That's the Reverend Dr. Robert McSwain, Associate Professor of Theology at the University of the South. Dr. McSwain is asking, Could a transformed human life be the best evidence for God? The question of evidence for God is ambiguous and hard to agree on. That's why Dr. McSwain is writing a book that explores an interesting but neglected argument for the divine. There's the cosmological argument that looks at the existence of the entire universe or cosmos. There's the teleological argument that looks at order or apparent design. There's the moral argument, which says we seem to have a sense of moral obligation. And there are also arguments based in human nature. People look at our capacity for reason and even consciousness. What's unusual about what I call the hegeological argument, or the argument from human holiness, is that it doesn't look at things that are very big or pervasive or abstract, but something very concrete. For example, a person that we might actually know or come in contact with. I first really grasped this through the work of Austin Farr, who says explicitly that the saint is our evidence. The traditional definition of a saint is someone who has already died, and that's not really what I mean. I mean people who are living at a higher level of holiness and love and altruism. So living saints. To me, it's both uh, an exciting discovery on one hand and a mystery on the other. Like, why haven't more people followed up on this. Hugh Lister, who is the man that Austin Farrer thought was a saint as a priest in poor urban neighborhoods. Somebody says that to be with him was to be challenged at the deepest level of thought and action, and all the more sharply because this effect was entirely unconscious. He was just himself, but being himself, he called you in question. But even within this new way of looking at humans as evidence of God, there are nuances. 
I think there are three versions, what I call the uh, propositional, the perceptual, and the performative. The propositional argument is that there are human lives that are so altruistic, so much lived for others, that the best explanation for these lives is that they somehow speak of God. But other people say, when I'm in this person's presence, I feel God. It's just a direct religious experience. John Meacham says that people who were in John Lewis's life had an ambient sense of, of divine presence. The performative uh, is even more interesting in the sense that it says, no, it's that over the whole course of this person's life, they've somehow lived out the evidence for God. It would be easier for us if we could just say, you know, here's the argument for God's existence, accept it or not. But what Rowan Williams suggests is that God doesn't give us arguments, God gives us lives. That that's how God makes himself real, is through other human lives. And of course, that then presents us the challenge to ourselves become the kind of life that speaks of God to others. So what is it exactly about these unique lives that gets our attention? While they may make us feel uncomfortable, we still feel that somehow in them we're seeing how humans should be. In his forthcoming book, The Saint is Our Evidence, Dr. McSwain digs into this fascinating premise, including questions he has yet to fully resolve, like how many of these saints are among us? I think it's a really interesting question. It's got to be a significant enough number that most of us have at least had an indirect encounter, but it also has to be small enough for them to be still very rare and precious. So see, that's another kind of interesting take on what a saint is and could be and, and, and um, uh, the way that a saint's life works uh, for us and operates for us. Uh, and I thought is interesting because right off the bat, right, what is the number one rule for the Roman Catholic process? Saints got to be dead. But actually in Rob McSwain's estimation, part of what has to be going on here is that saints are still are living among us. Now, of course, in order to die, you have to have once lived. So, um, so that may sound like splitting hairs, but Rob is more interested in um, what do saintly lives living amongst us now attest to and say about the existence of God? I think it's a really interesting question. So I'm looking forward to his uh, book coming out. Uh, but wanted to put that out there as yet another way to conceive of and think about saints as we begin this journey together looking at these different lives of faith. So, I'm afraid to hit the next arrow because I don't remember. It's not showing me my notes. So we're going to step into the void. No, we're not. We're not. I'm going to leave it right here because I don't know. It's going to exit out or something. So we're going to keep it here. Um, but just to say that I'm excited uh, to embark on this journey, to talk about the lives of the saints, uh, but also wanted to acknowledge today that uh, the, the saints, because they are human, are messy people, and figuring out what makes a saint is a messy process, which is what I wanted to highlight today. Um, but that they are, I think, worthy of our study and discussion because every single person, this is something I hope you've heard me preach on, I hope you know is important to me, that each and every person has a story to tell, it's worth telling, and, it, and it, it's worth telling because it's worth hearing. I believe that we sometimes have the biggest spiritual revelations and we grow the most as Christians, not only when we are telling our story to someone else and the way that God's been active and at work, even if we don't think we see it there, um, as we do uh, listening to someone else uh, tell their story. Because you may be able to see God's work and action in someone's life when they can't see it themselves and reflect that back to them in a, in a really incredible way. And so I think that's how the saints work too, is by studying their lives and stories, we see God at work in our own, just as we see God at work in their lives. And so I'm really excited uh, for this class. I think it'll be a lot of fun because I'll tell you, especially as we get um, into the medieval saints in particular, though even before that, um, there are some ones... 
some really interesting stories, okay, and really interesting myths that get attached to some of these. St. Bridget in particular is one of my favorites, okay, so we'll, um, there are some fun ones that we'll study. But what we'll do is, like I said, we'll take a few a week and we'll kind of talk about them. I'll share with you about their life and witness and we'll discuss what their life and witness has to say to us. And we're going to go chronologically. So by the end, we'll end up um, pretty close to our own day, okay, and talking about talking about that. And, and through it, through this study, I not only hope that we will come away with a deeper or richer or more uh, variegated understanding of what a holy life looks like, uh, but also that we'll explore a little bit of the challenges of what it means to regard others in high esteem, right? Especially as we get closer to our own day, that's harder. It's easier to regard someone in high esteem who's been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years because there's a lot of separation from the messiness of their life and witness. So we'll talk about all of these things uh, throughout this fall, and I'm really excited to do that with all of you. So before we conclude, we've got just a few more minutes left. Does anybody have any questions uh, or anything uh, before we end today in prayer we go do church? I know there's not probably a, a whole lot of things that I talked about that have questions with them today. In the same way, but yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. So Jerry brings up the idea of healing as a miracle that is often used, or as a phenomenon that is often used as a as a miracle to attest to someone's sainthood. Right? We were talking about that in the Roman Catholic process for canonization. And, and Jerry's point was that if you, you know, if you're laying your hands on someone and you pray for them for healing and then they, you know, they, they're healed, was that you doing that or was that God's work uh, in and through you using you as a vessel? And Jerry's point was that that's God's work. And I think, I think, the, I think the Catholic Church would say that too, right? That we have no power in ourselves to save ourselves, even the saints. Um, but um, but that, that is, uh, that's a really good point, yeah. To make, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. What is y'all's? Y'all have any? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, in what? In what way? Hmm. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. So the question was, is there any sort of differentiation between sort of male and female saints, especially in traditions where, I mean, well, the Roman Catholic Church is kind of a good example of this, right? Because women can't be ordained, uh, but yet there are certainly a lot of female saints uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, there's, so, so it's a good question, but I think I would say there's not a distinction between male and female saints, though there is a distinction, and the, the, the Catholic Church probably has language for this. But um, there is distinction, obviously, between maybe degrees of importance in some way. Not between male and female, but I just mean overall. That may be imperfect, but like, for instance, there's a reason why in the Catholic Church, Mary is treated a lot differently than, say, St. Teresa or St. Cecilia or something like that, right? Is that Mary is the God-bearer, the mother of Jesus, right? And so therefore, there's a different level of importance placed upon her. Um, and so I would say there may be some sort of gradation that way, gradation that way as opposed to male and female, but, um, but not really. And most, I mean, again, most Protestant denominations don't really venerate the saints, including the Episcopal Church. We commemorate them. Right? We commemorate the saints. So in the, the calendar of saints that we have, there are commemorations for different days. So days when we remember their life and witness, there's a little uh, special collect for those days. So we'll, you know, the opening, the, the collect of the day that opens the service, that will be different on a saint's day, and it'll talk about something that that saint did or that their life, uh, that was consequential about their life for us. Um, and so we remember them and commemorate them but we don't venerate them in the same way as, say, the Roman Catholic Church does. Um, 
And so it's a little bit different. And then, of course, like most other Protestant denominations don't really have at least an official idea of remembering or commemorating the saints in the same way as we do. But that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you don't make it all the way in the bracket, basically, yes, yes. What happens to you in that process? You don't go back to just being a normal person. Um, yeah, you don't get, like, demoted back down. But you would stay at whatever holiness level. Again, it gets, it gets hard to talk about. Like, I don't even know how to, you, you would stay where you are. Like, you would be the blessed so-and-so. Because, you know, maybe you only had one miracle and not two or whatever, right? And so you couldn't make, yeah. So it's, it gets tricky to talk about because, it, it, again, it's what I'm saying. It's messy, right? It's messy. But no, you wouldn't get demoted back down. But that's a really good question, though. Yeah, yeah. I believe so, yeah. That the, yes, the term devil's advocate as, is a, a reference, actually, to that canonization process where there would be somebody who plays the devil's advocate to try to push against you know, this person's uh, pr yeah, supposed holiness. Right? And, um, so, uh, yeah, that's right. So we actually reference that pretty much all the time and not knowing that we're talking about the same process. Yeah. Well, I'd be interested, too, to know. Um, we've got just a couple more minutes. Um, did anybody, uh, what is, how did this, um, the idea of the hagiological argument for God's existence strike some of you? I'd be interested to know. I mean, do you, have you felt um, that you have, that s the witness of someone's life for you has been an attestation of God's kind of reality in your life? What, what is your thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah, it's sort of more palpable when you're with them. Yeah, 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 that, that's, yes, about being in the presence of somebody and um, that, that being in their presence, uh, God's, God's presence is felt uh, in a way, yeah. I think, so personally, I think there's, one, one of the things that I find captivating about it is the incarnational nature of it, the idea of the church as the body of Christ. Um, I, I, find it, I find that argument captivating that um, mostly because I, too, have sort of experienced um, people who have lived lives or lived in ways that when I am with them or think about the way that they lived, it makes me want to be a better Christian, a better person, to be more loving to other people, to be more open-hearted and expansive in the way that I, you know, that I, I engage with the world. And so, I, yeah, there is something captivating to me about that. Ooh, that's really good. Yeah, that when you're a mature Christian, like, that's who you want to be when you grow up. Yeah, I feel that 100%, you know? I mean, I think about, and that could be, and oftentimes, I think, is lived out in the lives of quiet but incredibly dedicated and faithful people who show up, right? I think presence is really important, like, people who show up, not just in other people's lives. But I think about, like, you know, the, the lady who somehow was, like, old when you were a kid, but also still is just old the whole time. You don't know how, you know, but taught Sunday school faithfully for like decades and decades and decades, right? And like dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of kids grew up with Miss So-and-so teaching them their memory verse of the day. You know what I mean? And that that person just lived a life of just incredible holiness in that way, you know, but, but was not out there banishing snakes from Ireland or whatever. You know what I mean? I don't know. I, I find something compelling about this, and we'll kind of talk about it again more and more as we go through the lives of the saints throughout the course of the fall. But again, it's good to be with you today. I'm excited uh, to embark on this, and I want to say at the outset, part of why I chose this study is I know that over the course of the fall, we're going to be in and out. I'm going to be in and out a little bit, but this is a material that you can jump in without, if you missed a week or whatever, you're not going to lose out on anything, okay? It's, uh, it's not cumulative in that way because each week will stand on its own, okay? And so I'm just trying to eliminate 
Anybody using this excuse of like, well, I missed, I don't know. I don't know if I'll, it's fine, <laughs> okay? Um, I chose this particularly because it's, it's conducive um, to people coming in and out and still being able to connect with something that we do. So I'd love for you to be here every week, but as many uh, as you can catch is great, and I'm excited to embark on this journey with you to learn more about um, those figures of our faith. So let's conclude in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, I do thank you for those examples and witnesses that all of us um, probably have in our minds right now and in our hearts right now of people who, I love how Kate put it, that, that they're the kind of Christians we want to be when we grow up. Um, and I thank you for putting those people in our lives. I thank you for the inspiration that they are to us. And I pray that as we continue to learn more about those, as I said, who have come before, who have lived lives, not perfect lives, but lives of grace, and who have tried each and every day to follow you more closely, I pray that we would be inspired and encouraged to do the same. Through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.